So uh, what motivated this work was we were trying to see uh, how can the companies and supply chain actually uh, be incentivized to do a better job in reducing emissions and uh, how can we find uh, a good way of allocating emission responsibility for supply chain members. Uh, so we found that current ways in which, in most cases, emissions are allocated primarily to the company that uh, produces directly does not generate the right incentives. Uh, and so we looked at the game theoretical uh, from, uh, approach and tried to find allocation rules that have some nice property that will be easy to implement, easy to understand and uh, provide right uh, incentives to companies in terms of uh, uh, discouraging gaming of the system and investing in uh, curbing emissions. Uh, so what we were able to do is to, uh, to show that uh, based on our model uh, the Shapley value is actually uh, the allocation rule that can uh, meet many different criteria. So it, uh, uh, from the viewpoint of general game theory, it is commonly used in uh, cost allocation, uh, but has some negative features such as uh, complexity of calculation uh, and uh, non-core membership, which we showed can be avoided in our specific case, that we can calculate it in an easy way. Uh, and that it uh, discourages uh, kind of gaming of the system, it encourages company to invest in uh, emission abatement early uh, and although it was shown that uh, we cannot generate socially optimal abatement uh, incentives if we don't do double counting of emissions, we show that uh, Shapley value actually uh, gives uh, the best result when we don't allow for double counting in terms of that it is robust, that it minimizes the maximum defections from the socially optimum levels. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the seminar session of the PhD program in economic side. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Grace Sosik. Uh, she is an associate professor on the, of, uh, an associate professor of uh, data sciences and operation at the Marshall School of Business at the University of Southern California. Uh, her research interests are on um, uh, supply chain management, sustainability, cooperation and competition in supply chain, <coughs> pay special attention on quality information. Uh, she is also associate editor of journal as operation research, um, um, uh, manufacturing of service of operation management, production of operation management. And we met, uh, I think, uh, in 2010. Yep, no, yeah. Yes. <laughs> years ago, we met first time in a conference in Newport Beach. And then, since that time, I mean, we have met. Uh, Maybe every year in yeah, different conferences, yeah. conference, and we started to work together. We have published two papers, and I think it's also it is your third time yes, here in the visiting here. Yeah. So she has been visiting us uh, several times, and now it's uh, okay. I'm glad that uh, you present your research on incentive and emission responsibility allocation in supply chain. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all for having me. As Anna said, uh, uh, I've already been here. I like coming here. So the city is great. The people here are great. So it's always fun. And it actually has been productive. So that's also an, uh, a good bonus to hear from the visit. Uh, so the, uh, the topic I'm presented today, it's part of some of the newer, uh, newer area that I started looking at, which looks at, uh, uh, at environmental issues related to supply chains. And this, uh, the idea for this came when I was uh, uh, listening to a talk that uh, one of our colleagues from the university on the other side of the town that we don't like to mention by name, but it goes under UCLA. So he gave a talk uh, at our school and uh, one part of uh, his talk kind of uh, triggered the memory that uh, reminded me of, uh, of a talk that uh, Danny, who was my advisor when I was a PhD student, gave uh, uh, gave to our program and I will mention both of these papers a little bit more later when it comes to them but kind of it started me thinking about this and I put it kind of in some mental drawer and then soon afterwards Danny and Frida who were both my advisors 
uh, came to uh, spend the sabbatical at USC and we started working on this problem. And we were excited about many different aspects and then there were some parts that we were a little bit less excited so we got our two PhD students to take care of those parts as we usually do. So this is kind of the uh, Hailong and Sanjita PhD students and Danny and Frida were my advisors and we haven't done uh, joint work since I graduated so it was fun to work with them again kind of on, on something. So just to uh, give a little bit of a background of the story, some of you may be more familiar with some of the environmental issues, some of you may be less familiar, so just to give some general background. So uh, why are we talking about greenhouse gas emissions and what do we mean by it? So if we look at what is happening in the atmosphere, when we look at thousands of years, there has been some pretty regular cycles uh, in terms of how much uh, carbon particles we had in the air. And when the, the, the level would uh, get up, we would have some ice age periods. And if we see what has been happening for the last, uh, let's say, less than 100 years, we can see that we actually went way, way over what we usually had in the past. So there has been significant change in how much carbon we have in the environment today. And there have been some visible changes in how it influences the environment and it, it has an impact on our lives in terms of higher temperatures, let's say in summer, uh, more unpredictable rains, more flooding, let's say we have in US, uh, some uh, higher uh, levels, numbers of tornadoes and similar things that can have impact on the businesses as well, not only at our personal lives. So why do we call this set of gases greenhouse gases is because they uh, and they are uh, present in the atmosphere uh, and they, uh, they, they generate the effect similar to greenhouse gas so they absorb infrared radiation and trap the heat inside the atmosphere. Uh, and the most uh, uh, present one and most well known one is CO2 which is responsible for about 82% of uh, uh, greenhouse gas in the atmosphere and it comes from everyday things so whenever you're driving your car or anything you're generated some CO2 but there are some other greenhouse gases that are present at much uh, smaller concentrations but can have much more significant impact so methane uh, comes when uh, in most cases when we talk about cows growing cattle and when they uh, when they burp, they generate a lot of methane, so cattle growing is in the US one of the big sources of CO2. Uh, nitrous oxides uh, come from, uh, in many cases, from uh, artificial fertilizers, so when you create artificial fertilizers, there is a lot of uh, uh, N2O uh, being released. And different uh, fluorinated gas uh, gases uh, are pretty, uh, pretty small in terms of percentage, but they can have really huge impact, and what I uh, mean by this is kind of given in this table. So if you look at uh, these gases, uh, each of them has very different life, uh, life expectancy. So the time it takes for them to uh, actually decay. Uh, and so the, like methane can stay in atmosphere for about 12 years. Uh, some of these F gases can stay for thousands of years in the atmosphere. And the impact they have depends on what kind of the horizons we are looking at and how long is their life cycle. So, uh, this is all kind of uh, in comparison with CO2, so how much of the, uh, how much heat uh, different gases trap compared to uh, CO2. CO2 is assumed to have one unit and this is how much stronger than CO2 these guys are. So we can see because methane has relatively short life, its impact over 20 years is much bigger than over 100 years. But for some of these guys, like those F gases that I mentioned, you can see that the impact is thousands of times higher than uh, when we talk about regular CO2. And uh, so for instance, uh, Freon, which has a really strong impact, is the gas being present in uh, some older versions of refrigerators and uh, the, the industry is trying to phase it out, not to use it anymore because of the bad impact it has on the environment. Okay, so uh, when we talk further about this, what exactly uh, does it mean when we talk about one metric ton of CO2, which is something that we often hear? So this is how one metric ton of CO2 looks like. So if this is like an average person, this is how big the box would be. It's about uh, 27 uh, feet long, uh, uh, long cube. So one foot is about 30 centimeters, so you can get uh, how much is this in meters. Uh, and if you burn uh, one uh, metric ton of coal, you generate about that uh, twice as much uh, amount of CO2. Uh, 
And if we look at how we actually can get rid, uh, get rid of CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, most often we talk about trees and we say how trees are good because they capture CO2 and store it. And if you look at one tree, uh, it, uh, uh, over 40 years, it can capture about a quarter of a metric ton. And one car uh, in the US has much worse uh, performance in terms of miles per gallon than here in Europe because the, the gas is different, etc. But like what is typical in the US is let's say you have about 20 miles per gallon per car and people drive quite a bit, so you have about 12,000 miles per year. And if this is your car, you would generate about 5.5 metric tons per year. So uh, to get rid of emissions coming from one car, you would need 20 trees to work over 40 years. So it's kind of just to give a little bit of a better understanding. Because usually we just talk about these things in a very abstract way, just to give you a little bit better picture about what it means uh, in terms of some things we encounter in everyday life. So this has uh, kind of been going on for quite some time. We see that we have more and more CO2 in the environment. And uh, the world and the companies and the country started to see a little bit that we should do something about it. So one of the biggest deals that was done was uh, done in 2015 when uh, almost all the countries in the world uh, kind of adopted uh, agreement, like a Paris Agreement. And uh, uh, by May of this year, uh, 175 countries and EU uh, became a party to it. Unfortunately, our dear president said that we should not be a party to it, but uh, it is not supposed to take place until 2020, so things may happen in the meantime, so we'll see uh, whether the U.S. will stay a part of it or not. Officially, the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, withdrew, but as, as I said, it's not uh, really binding until 2020. So what is a Paris Agreement? Uh, what it does, it's kind of looking at how can we actually try to I try to curb the emissions, to reduce the emissions in the air, to try to prevent uh, warming from getting up to degrees Celsius because it can have a big impact on uh, melting polar caps, increasing the level of the sea, etc. Et and it gives different instructions about how companies, how different countries, let's say countries that are more developed should help less developed countries, uh, and so on and so on. So this is kind of in general something about greenhouse gases. So where are they coming from? This is looking at uh, different, uh, uh, different sources that can uh, actually generate CO2. And what we can see is that uh, really a lot of it is related to supply chains, to production, to the things that we are in some way looking at, kind of if you look at operations management and how the companies should do their business. And, uh, uh, carbon disclosure project estimates that about 20%, about one-fifth is generated by supply chains. So if you're doing some research in this area, it seems it should be something we should be concerned with and trying to see if we can help in achieving some of the goals of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and uh, a carbon disclosure project uh, is starting, okay, started uh, working with some of the biggest players, with uh, some of the biggest companies uh, in the world, trying to collect data uh, to ask them to report some data about emissions in their supply chains. And the idea is uh, that even uh, if you don't demand companies to do something, or people, regardless, uh, just asking them to actually uh, account for what they are doing to, uh, to measure it may induce them to actually start doing something about it once they become aware of the impact they have on the environment. So in many cases, when I talk to my students in my supply, uh, sustainability class, some of them say, you know, I never knew what my company was doing, but then uh, once we kind of started talking about it, I went to see, and actually they are doing something or they are not doing something, and I'm looking what I can uh, do to make them uh, kind of start adopting some, some kind of policy. Okay, so this is what uh, we currently uh, kind of have out there. So what is exactly carbon footprint when we talk about all of these emissions? So when we talk about carbon footprint, we are looking at uh, how much of uh, the total of greenhouse gases, so we talk about carbon because as I said CO2 is the most represented one, but we are talking in general about all greenhouse gases, will uh, be emitted over a period of time and it can be measured on different levels. So one way to look at it is to look at the company, so what exactly is the company putting out there and it can be used when we are trying to uh, assign some responsibility to the company, whether it's to taxes, uh, cap and trade, and so on. And the other is what some companies are doing. 
trying to evaluate uh, how green or how dirty their products are. So looking from the getting uh, raw materials to the manufacturing, to the usage, to the disposal or recycling, what exactly is the, the impact, uh, the footprint of specific products so that if customers know something about it, they may decide to make their choices, kind of selecting greener product, the one that has less impact on the environment. So for instance, Apple started putting some uh, information about it out quite some time ago. And this was looking at, uh, let's say, iPhone 3G and iPhone 5S. So it was four years uh, between them. Uh, and you can see, for instance, when you look at how the, the gases were dis uh, distributed for iPhone 3G, uh, almost about half was coming from customer use. And what it means is actually charging your iPhone. Uh, and if you had one of those early iPhones, you can remember that they were horrible. You had to recharge them all the time because like, they were really losing power very fast. And so with the new generations, uh, they have better power management, so you have to charge your uh, iPhones less often. So only 20% was coming from customer use, but production emissions went from 45% to 83%. Uh, and uh, so if we look at the iPhone 3, the total emissions were uh, 55 kilos, so 25 kilos was coming from production. Uh, and with the later model, it was 65 kilos and we have even higher percentage, so it more than doubled the amount of emissions coming from production. And so the reason is here different materials, different sizes, and all of these things kind of changed. And uh, if you look at the newer models, uh, the total amount of emissions ch changed uh, with time. So iPhone 6, it went from 65 to 95. And then for the later model, they actually made it uh, a little bit lower again, changed the materials, uh, etc. So now that we have all of these numbers, uh, one question that comes is, who should be responsible for these emissions? Is Apple responsible for this? Or should uh, manufacturers be responsible? These are all the different materials being used, and Apple doesn't have anything to do with any of these materials. They sit uh, somewhere in California, they design the marketing strategy, they design the product, but they don't really make glass or make uh, screens or anything. So we have all of these materials being used. We have, let's say, 57 kilos of CO2 for the latest iPhone. But uh, who should be responsible for these emissions in case there is anything being done in terms of uh, making somebody uh, paying for the emissions? And so this is kind of uh, one of the big problems because uh, so at the moment, uh, many of the countries, many of the communities don't actually have the uh, legislation which makes somebody responsible for greenhouse gases. European Union has introduced something kind of years back, California has, so some of the other communities. Uh, but uh, many, uh, many uh, communities don't have anything, and this is uh, why we sort of have this effect of the tragedy of the commons, you know. If, uh, if nobody uh, is responsible and if reducing emissions increases my costs, why would I do it? So I don't have to pay for it, so I can just emit uh, as before and uh, somebody else would take, uh, the take care of the cost because the, the emissions have some cost. So it has uh, some impact on the environment, it has some impact on human health and we are all paying for it uh, and not the companies who are responsible. So uh, this is why we have seen all this increase in emissions and so the economists are trying to argue that uh, un unless we use the polluter pay principle we will not be able to curb the emissions. And as I said, some of the uh, communities started doing something. So cup and trade is uh, originated, uh, the, the concept originated with uh, acid rains on the eastern coast of uh, US kind of quite some time ago. Uh, they wanted to, uh, to limit the amount of sulfur dioxide that was going into the air. Uh, and then uh, European Union kind of liked how the model worked and they adopted it in Europe and some uh, parts of China are experimenting with this and California also started doing it about five years ago. Uh, some other communities opted to use carbon tax, so British Columbia, Colorado, etc. decided to do the tax and uh, these two uh, different economists will argue that one model is better or the other. But it's not clear which one actually has better effect. So with carbon tax, you are free to generate as much pollution as you want, but you have to pay for it. So nobody is saying, you know, this is the limit. You can just do whatever you want, but you have to pay for the pollution that you put out there. And here the critical thing is to decide how, how much do you have to pay for a ton of CO2 that you put out. If the cost is too low, 
then you don't really care, you don't want to do anything, you will pay it and continue business as usual. If the cost is too high, it may have a negative impact on production, so the uh, population may suffer. So you want to, to uh, find the right number, the cost, which will make company have an incentive to actually reduce the emissions and uh, still keep the production level high. Uh, the other alternative is the one in which the price is not fixed, but the amount is fixed. So in cap and trade, there is a certain limit to the companies, like how much they are permitted to actually put out there. Uh, and so some companies use everything that is uh, assigned to them. Some companies are using less. So those companies that need some more, uh, some more uh, allowances can trade with companies that have extra and pay them for getting some of the allowances or they can invest in carbon offsets, so let's say reforestation, <coughs> uh, similar things to, uh, to cover the amount that they uh, exceeded their, uh, their limit. Uh, and so here the price will be determined by market and so th there were some negative feedbacks on this initially because unfortunately when it started being used in Europe, it was around the time of economic crisis, so nobody was really hitting the limits and there was like very low price was being raised, so the, the effect was not there. Uh, in California, we, we see now that the price actually is slight, uh, kind of slowly going up. It started with about uh, $10 per ton, now it reached about 14 so it is kind of year by year, it is going up and the market is increasing, so California is now collaborating with uh, uh, with the market in Quebec and Ontario is also kind of planning to join so we have international uh, market of cup and trade also in North America. So again kind of uh, uh, there is no clear, uh, uh, clear agreement about which of these models works better but clearly you know if any of these is in place it, it gives some incentive to companies to do something about. But we come back to the original question so let's say we, uh, we in California we have cup and trade Apple is located in California, they are designing their products, designing their marketing campaigns, so they have some stores operating there, but all the manufacturing happens elsewhere. So there is not really manufacturing happening uh, close to, uh, to Apple and its company. So who should be responsible for those emissions? Should Apple be responsible for it and these guys not? Should these guys be responsible for it or should we find some good balance in allocating these emissions partially to different uh, players in the supply chain? So how things are currently working is uh, that most often we have full producer responsibility. So the company that is actually making the product is responsible for the entire emissions uh, that is being generated. So you can see if you look at the Apple's example, well, uh, all the manufacturers in China, Europe uh, and elsewhere are responsible for the emissions. So Apple doesn't really have any incentive to pick somebody who is using greener technologies to work on reducing its impact because they really don't have any financial burden of uh, being more or less green. Uh, the other extreme is uh, looking at uh, assigning all the responsibilities to the most downstream party in the supply chain. So in, uh, it's not used very much. There are some examples in which uh, it's being used in accounting. And so here Apple would be assigned all responsibility and upstream manufacturers would be free of any responsibility. Again, it doesn't seem to be the best choice because then uh, you know, these guys don't have any incentive to do any improvements because they don't care if they are doing a dirty thing uh, or not. And so it seems that uh, like something that is between these two would be a better thing to use than having one of these extremely extreme allocations because uh, whichever one you use, there are some parts in the supply chain that are likely to be extremely unhappy. Now, one of the things uh, that uh, comes up often uh, when we talk about emissions allocation is a double counting. So what happens uh, when uh, you have different firms reporting the same emissions? Let's say, you know, like here, everybody is traveling using planes. And let's say you use Iberia, and uh, you are, uh, let's say you're counting you for your emissions, and you put uh, uh, emissions from flights uh, uh, as part of your emissions. But Iberia is also putting these uh, emissions, because this is their main business, so they're also putting these emissions. So if you, are, if you want to get what is the total amount of emissions generated in Spain, you would get wrong amount if everybody is just reporting these things without classifications, because air travel would be accounting two times, once by you, once by Iberia. Uh, 
So uh, what uh, Greenhouse Gas Protocol is trying to do is to give some instructions, again, although this is not uh, required legally in many communities, how companies or individuals should report their emissions. So they divide emissions in three scopes, so what they refer to as scope. And so scope one is direct emission. So this is what your organization is responsible for directly, uh, except the electricity that you purchase for your own use. So everything else, uh, kind of operation of offices, heating, uh, kind of cleaning, all the emissions generated in uh, running the, the school, let's say, would be included in scope one emissions. Scope two would be just electricity-based emissions. And then scope three would be all upstream and downstream emissions. So everything that is happening uh, kind of upstream, let's say if you are looking at uh, uh, these guys, so production of these, how much emissions are generated and so on. So everything happening from supplier side and everything happening from consumer side. So your students coming to school and uh, you know driving here and so on. So all of these emissions would be scope three. And once they are classified in these categories, it's kind of easier to see what should be counted, what is already accounted by uh, somebody else. And so scope one are those direct emissions, so all companies should report this. And if they report these upstream and downstream, they should classify them as scope two and scope three emissions. So what did we try to do here? So how did we approach this? So being in game theory, of course, we wanted to model this as a game. So, you know, like if you are, uh, if you uh, have me, everything looks like a nail. And uh, we, uh, we first had a different name for this game, but the acronym was very ugly. Uh, and then we came with a weird name, which has a nice acronym. So we just refer it to as a green game, kind of from now on, but then kind of don't really worry about what the official name of the game is. So we call it a green game. And what we, uh, uh, what we assumed here is that we have a, a graph which represents a supply chain, which is directed. Uh, so each node is one supply chain member and there is an arc coming from a node uh, and this arc has a weight and this weight uh, represents the emissions that come from this specific node. Now, so how do we model this is that each player uh, is allocated some, uh, uh, some arcs uh, so that we are looking at uh, what arcs uh, is he or she responsible for directly, so let's say scope one emissions that they generate directly in their production, but we also assign indirect responsibility. So for instance, uh, let's say if you look at Apple and Apple can, uh, uh, can talk to their suppliers and tell them, you know, I want a different material, the one that is greener, or I want different, uh, uh, different uh, source of power that you use for your facilities, so they can uh, indirectly impact uh, some emissions. And so we assign this indirect responsibility as well to these players. So for instance, if this is a supply chain, let's say that this is a manufacturer, that these are two suppliers, and this is a distributor. So we would say distributor really doesn't have any impact on what is happening in the manufacturing process. So he should be responsible only for his direct emissions because like, he cannot influence how can they make the product. A manufacturer is responsible for his direct emissions. He can also have some impact on his suppliers, kind of in terms of what type of energy, what types of material they are using. And he can have an impact on, let's say he can have to say to the distributor, uh, I want you to use hybrid vehicles, not regular vehicles, so we have less impact on the environment. So let's say node seven can be uh, responsible directly for this emission, but indirectly, let's say for this, this, and this as well, because it can have an impact on different parties uh, in its supply chain. So what we are uh, assuming in this case, we are looking at supply chains in which they can be a strong player, let's say Apple, Walmart, company like this, which can have an impact on its supply chain partners, and they assign responsibility for different players. So clearly there is a responsibility for direct emissions, but there can be this indirect possibility so that uh, the firms that you can have an impact on emissions in, in, in their parts, uh, you should uh, have some responsibility for the amount and volume of these emissions. Again, I mentioned Walmart as one example. If you look at Walmart, Walmart have, uh, is a part of huge supply chains. But what Walmart 
is actually doing on their own, they are operating their stores, distribution centers, and the logistics fleet. So if you look at the entire supply chain, they're actually responsible for a very small portion of emissions, just what is happening at the end. And everything has to be manufactured somewhere, sourced from somewhere, moved to, uh, to US or to the distribution centers. So they, they, uh, uh, they actually figure out that about 90% of their emissions comes from somewhere else in the supply chain. Uh, and they wanted, uh, in 2005, they started putting some efforts into reducing emissions in their supply chain. And as a part of this whole strategy, in 2007, they asked their suppliers to start reporting their emissions in order to kind of account for it. Uh, and seven years later, kind of a number of their suppliers actually mentioned that uh, they, uh, just by the fact that they were asked to report, they started doing something to curb these emissions. So clearly some of these things can actually help cut your costs uh, because, you know, if you are more efficient, you generate less emissions, but you also uh, lower your costs. Some of these may not uh, directly kind of reduce costs, but may have some other uh, long-term goals that can be helpful. And these were from sustainable brands, so what they uh, found was that when they talked to different suppliers, they uh, found that uh, Walmart was the one that actually uh, uh, encouraged them and incentivized them most often to invest in reducing uh, their carbon footprint. So this kind of seems that uh, it's a reasonable setting to use. And uh, so just to briefly go over some basic concepts from game theory that we used in our approach. So we will denote by N the set of all players, uh, coalitions, which are subsets of N will be denoted by S, and we will be looking at cost game. So uh, we are looking at uh, uh, function C, which assigns to every coalition a certain value, and this value will be emission that is generated uh, by this coalition. And clearly because, so we can me me uh, model this as a value or a cost game, because we want to cut emissions as much as possible, the cost game is appropriate. Uh, Thing here and so how the game is actually uh, defined is we say that the cost of coalition is the sum of all emissions such that uh, uh, there is a member in the coalition who is responsible for these costs directly or indirectly. So we are looking at all the members and if a specific uh, player here is responsible for, for the pollution in certain arc, this arc is accounted uh, for here as a cost of the specific set. Uh, additional thing is uh, looking at uh, some desirable types of allocation. So we are, uh, we are looking uh, in a setting of the cooperative game, although we don't really model this exactly as uh, the cooperative game in a sense that uh, there can be coalitions that can uh, secede from the grand coalition, which is what we usually look at. We look at possible defections from grand, grand coalition. So in this case, uh, we don't assume that uh, like a subset of uh, players can kind of move and uh, do the separate supply chains. Could you go back to the previous one? Sure. So in the definition of the cost function, mm -hmm. S is a, is a condition, it's yes. a subset of them, right? Yes. So in the picture of the tree, mm -hmm. so you have a tree, mm -hmm. so it makes sense that you know, the, the, the structure makes sense because you have the producer, that the, mm -hmm. the supply for the producers and so on. So S is a subset. Mm -hmm. It may be the case that you know you don't have this three structure with this. No, so the, this uh, that's clear that you don't need to have it, and this is what I'm saying now. So we are looking here at uh, we are talking about core and similar things, but it's it's not in a sense that sub coalition can separate and move. So kind of similar to what I said, it's not that somebody may move. We are just trying to look at some of these concepts just in terms of trying to have some element of fairness so that you are not allocated more than what would be generated by this set. It doesn't have to be connected. It doesn't have to be right. a subset of three. Okay. If I interpret the, you know, the value function in the mm -hmm. of the theory, I understand that C of S is the cost that people within S, or the supply mm -hmm. producer within mm -hmm. S, would produce mm -hmm. if they jointly do something, right? Yes. But in order to do that, they have to have the ability of doing such a thing. But no, but they they are not, that's what I answer. If, if they are not able to produce the product, so it's like they are not going to... No, so this is, this is traditional how we talk okay. about core. And as I said, this is not what we are looking at here. 
And this is what is also, like, there are some other papers that have similar things and I reference them uh, kind of in the paper because traditionally we think of our locations and so on as a tool to de a deter defections. This is not what we do. We don't assume that, you know, now two players can go and do their separate supply chain and these guys can function independently. Uh, we're just kind of using this as some, some measure of fairness, you know, okay, we don't want to over allocate our emissions to certain subsets of players. Again, so this is like the, the, the typical definition of the core allocations. So how should we allocate, let's say, uh, emissions to some uh, to players if we want the allocation to be in the core? Uh, it should be efficient, so the entire amount of emissions should be allocated. Uh, and each coalition should be allocated at most what they can do, uh, what they would do by, the, uh, by themselves. Again, related to this discussion that we just had. So here we don't look at it as a, uh, as a measure, measure for de deterring defections. It's just more used as some measure of fairness to have uh, people not being over allocated emissions uh, based on what they actually are doing. Uh, one of the uh, properties of, uh, when we talk about cooperative games, is convexity. So what convexity uh, means here is if we have a supply chain member and if, it, uh, if he or she is joining a larger set, his contribution is smaller than if he's joining a smaller set. So in a sense it makes sense because if you are uh, joining a larger se uh, set, more of the emissions are already accounted for, so you are contributing less than if you are joining a smaller set when fewer of the emissions have been allocated, so some of those that you are responsible for uh, are not already covered by somebody else. Uh, another part from game theory is uh, a specific allocation rule, which is uh, quite well known, which is the Shapley value. So Shapley value is uh, the unique allocation rule that uh, uh, meets these four criteria. It's symmetric, which means if two players are identical, they should have the same allocation. It has no player property. If somebody is responsible for zero emissions in this case, they should be allocated responsibility for zero. It's efficient. It's allocated the entire cost of emissions in this case. And this is the rule that will be specifically useful in our setting additivity which says that if we uh, separate the games into two games, we can calculate the Shapley value independently for each of these two games, and the Shapley value for the original game is just the sum of these two Shapley values. So it kind of, we can do some decomposition of the game into simpler games, do calculations separately for them, and then go back to the original game. The official definition is uh, for use for calculation is usually done by this, so we are looking at players' marginal contribution to all possible coalitions, and we are doing some weighted average of these numbers. And so, uh, clearly based on this, as we have to account for all possible coalitions, if we have a larger number of players, this gets pretty messy, and this is one of the reasons why we don't see Shapley value used more often in practice. So, if you look at some negative, uh, uh, negative properties of Shapley value, calculation can be complex, uh, and uh, it's also not always in the core, which means that sometimes if you use Shapley value, although it is uniquely determined, you may end up having some subsets being allocated more than what they would actually do on their own. Uh, on the positive side, uh, it has quite a few applications in cost allocation because of its perceived fairness. Uh, when you look at how it's being calculated, it's looking at players' marginal contribution, so the, it's kind of easy to understand what you're doing and uh, uh, it kind of looks to be fair because of uh, uh, these contributions that you're averaging over. Uh, and one additional thing uh, is if the game is convex, we actually get rid of this first negative attribute because for the convex games, Shapley value does belong to the core, so we uh, get rid of this. But we would still be uh, left with this possible, uh, possibly complex calculations. So now uh, we go back to our game and see what can we do about allocating emissions with things that we know from game theory. So first thing that uh, we found is uh, that the game is convex, which is a good thing. So we have non-empty core, uh, Shapley value belongs to the core, so we have many of these kind of nice uh, properties. 
But one can also say that those extreme allocations that I mentioned at the beginning, so producer and uh, uh, consumer responsibility, also belong to the core. So they, they're not always kind of very fair. So we kind of started thinking about Chaplin value as it is being uh, often used in cost allocation. But again, kind of the complexity was here as one of the deterrent. And this is where I go back uh, to when I started talking. I remember that uh, when I was a student, then he gave uh, a talk about the airport game. So this is an old paper. And this is a slight variation of the uh, paper by Little Child and Owen. So it's not exactly uh, as uh, what their paper says, but it's uh, very suitable. Kind of, it's easy to explain and it fits well with our, uh, with our problem. So suppose this is uh, an airport kind of uh, a landing area, and these are runways. So when the uh, when uh, the airplane lands, so all the airplanes land here, and then for Company A, let's say Lufthansa, they go this side. For let's say Iberia and Vueling, they go this side. So Iberia goes here, Vueling goes here, and so on. So each of these is different uh, airline company, and so some parts are used by more uh, airlines, some parts are used by fewer airlines. Uh, and there is a cost uh, involved in maintaining each of these runways. And the question is, how should they be allocated the cost for it? And so what, uh, what, can, be, uh, what can be easily seen when you look at this is that if we apply Shapley value to this problem, it's actually very neat and very easy to calculate it. So we get rid of this complexity issue because what the Shapley value says is, okay, how many, uh, how many companies are using this part? Five, so let's each pay one-fifth of this. How many companies are using this part? Two, okay, so let's each pay a half of it. So it's a very easy way to calculate and to allocate cost. So you can do it in this way. So 10 is split equally by all companies. A is the only one responsible for this cost and so on. So for this specific structure, for this type of the game, Shapley uh, can be calculated very easily. So we get rid of the other problem, which was complexity of calculation. Uh, and so what we, are sh what we have shown is that for our problem, we can actually do the same thing. So we look at a certain arc, we look at all companies that are allocated responsibility for this arc, directly or indirectly, and split it equally among them. And so this is how the, the emissions on a specific arc are being allocated. So it is easy to calculate. Uh, uh, it uh, is footprint balanced, which means it's efficient, and we don't have double counting, so we just account for all the emissions once, we don't have double counting, uh, and it is in the core. So we have kind of all of these nice properties. So this was the, the first kind of, uh, first run at the problem that we had. So use what you know, which is so cooperative game theory, see what you can do with it, what is suitable to, uh, from our kind of bag of tools. And we said, okay, so this is where we just kind of follow our instincts and do what we know should work. Then we said, okay, why don't we now try to approach it from a different way? Just kind of forget the specific allocation rules. Just try to think, if we are looking at the mission allocations, what do we think would be some nice properties that allocation rules should have, and then see what allocations can actually meet these criteria. So uh, we tried to find some, uh, some things that we thought were suitable. So one was uh, no free riding. What it means is uh, if, uh, uh, let's say, one firm invests in reducing emissions, uh, it should be the only one who benefits from actual emission reduction. It shouldn't be shared by others who did not participate in this. So for instance, if we go back to the original graph, and let's say uh, nodes one and three are the only one responsible for these emissions. So they are responsible directly and indirectly for these emissions. So let's say that uh, now uh, we use kind of everybody is allocated 2.5 here. And let's say they work together and they reduce this, uh, this emission from three to one. So what this property says is that the only, uh, that the only members of the supply chain who should share this benefit from this reduction should be three and one. The other guys did not do anything about it, so why should they see the benefits uh, from it? So this kind of uh, removes free riding problem. The other one is firm equivalence, which uh, says if firms are responsible for the same uh, set of polluting processes, their allocation should be equal. So going back to this example, so if three and one are responsible for, for these two, they should each be allocated one half. So they should uh, share this amount of three equally among themselves. And the other one is uh, the same one as from the definition of the Shapley value, 
if somebody is not polluting, they should not be responsible for anything. So it seems like a reasonable and fair conditions to have. So these were kind of looking uh, uh, from the perspective of fairness. Then we said, uh, okay, uh, what can be some additional kind of desirable things? So one of those, yes? In, in, in the last property, in the first and last, you mean what? In the, in the if uh, uh, if in there is zero, zero yeah. So the, the downstream company does not have to pay? If, if this is the only thing they are responsible for. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then we look at something that seems uh, a little bit uh, difficult and complex when you try to write it down, but it's easier to see an example. So process history independence, uh, what it means is, uh, so suppose now that we just look at the first two graphs. So we have we have uh, our supply chain and there is a pollution eight on this arc and let's say two is the only one who is responsible for this. And let's say two is uh, investing in these processes and is able to reduce this from eight to four. So two did the change and there is some reduction uh, in emission two is responsible for. And now there should be a change in the location that two uh, is observing. So what this property says is that if this is the case, or if this is the case where the other guys have twice as high uh, pollutions, the change in the location that two sees should be the same. So why is this important? It's important because if the change in your location depends on the emissions in other processes, uh, you may be incentivized to, let's say, delay investment until somebody else uh, does investment. So the whole things will be polluting more over a longer horizon. So if the change in your pollution does not change regardless of what the levels of other pollution is, you may very well do the investment as early as possible because the change in your location should be the same. So this is why we call it process history independence. Whatever the other guys are doing will not have an impact on how your allocation will change. And the second one was uh, disaggregation invariance. And it came because some companies are likely to play games and kind of create fictitious companies that generate zero emissions if they think they can actually reduce their allocation. So what we are saying is suppose that uh, this company four decides to split into two companies, four prime and four double prime, and one of them generates zero, zero pollution, the other generates whatever the original company was getting. What we are saying is that the total allocation to these two guys should be the same as the original allocation to four. So if you're doing this type of games, trying to actually game the system, you should not get any benefits from doing this. And so what we found is that if we uh, try to find the allocation rules that meet this criteria, the Shapley value is the only one that at the same time achieves firm equivalence, firm senility, and process history independence. So it is the one that will actually encourage the companies to invest as early as possible and have some fairness property. And also it's the only one that has a firm equivalence, no free riding, and it's disaggregation invariance. So it's kind of disincentivizing this gaming in the system. So again, so here we looked from the different approach. We were looking at desirable properties, uh, looking at all possible allocations, and found that the Shapley value is actually the only one that can meet these criteria simultaneously. So from two different viewpoints, we found that Shapley was working well. Then we also wanted to go back to the original paper, the one from, um, from uh, Felipe uh, that I saw at USC that motivated this whole thing. Uh, and this is kind of, uh, what, what is our allocation actually doing in terms of encouraging companies to reduce their emissions? So how can we uh, incentivize companies to do uh, abatement of pollution? And so the, the paper that I originally uh, saw presentation of was the paper by Felipe Charles and uh, uh, two of his, their Dutch colleagues, which was looking at double counting, something that I mentioned quite a bit, in supply chain footprinting. So what they look at, so they assume similar to us that uh, uh, firms can be responsible for pollution of different processes. They can do some uh, uh, imp impact influence on these emissions. They can exert some effort. There are some uh, properties of the functions that are being uh, underlined. Uh, and uh, the cost of actually reducing emissions is assumed to be convex and increasing. 
And uh, what they assume is that there is a, a fixed cost of, uh, of emissions. So we can see this as, let's say, carbon tax imposed by the government and the company. So the, uh, they, they did not look at specific allocation rules. They looked at the family of linear allocation rules. And so what they found was uh, that if you are uh, looking at footprint balance allocations, which means those that are efficient and do not double count, you will not be able to get first the best efforts in reducing emissions. So what uh, their title actually says is if you want to get uh, some uh, first best uh, uh, initiatives, you have to do some double counting, which means you should over allocate emissions in supply chain. Now that uh, may not really be desirable because there can be some issues in, you know, what have, if we are over allocating, who will get responsibility if there are some efforts in reducing those emissions and so on. Uh, and uh, so what we wanted to do is to see what happens if we don't look at the double counting. So if we assume that uh, we are looking at uh, instances which are footprint balanced, so without double counting, what is the best we can do? So how can we actually get to some nice results? And so what we uh, were comparing was in the first best outcome, uh, the society is trying to look at the total cost of abatement and uh, the emissions. Uh, and in the uh, individual decentralized model, each, uh, each party, each supply chain member is looking at what is the cost of reducing emissions plus what is his share of, uh, uh, of the cost of emissions, so his shares of pollution tax. Uh, and what we did was we assumed that we are looking at uh, uh, all possible linear allocation rules. So there can be some that we did not account for, but we are looking at families of linear allocations. What we shown was uh, is that uh, if the firm's cost of abatement is private information, then Shapley value is actually uh, uh, nice in the robust sense because it minimizes the maximum deviation from the socially optimal pollution level. So this was kind of the third, uh, the third uh, good property of Shapley value. So we looked at kind of using the well-known uh, uh, non-allocation rule, looking at nice properties of uh, allocation rules and the incentives for abatement. So from all of these three perspectives, we found that Shapley value uh, works fine. Now, uh, one of the problem is uh, that if you have noticed, I have so far only looked at trees, and trees are nice, and trees behave nicely, but uh, clearly all supply chains don't look like trees. So we will have you know, one supplier supplying several members of the supply chains, we will have several uh, different end products. So what we are dealing with in general is something that is a little bit messier than just a tree. So what does it mean for our problem? Can we still have our nice results? So this may not look like a complex graph, but from perspective of uh, you know, how to do the allocations, it is actually much more complex than a tree because we have here one node from which we have two different arcs coming out. So in a tree, we have one arc coming from a node. Here we have node four having two different nodes coming out. And so let's say that we, uh, that we claim that uh, three is responsible for emissions coming out of node five. So three has responsibility for E5. What does it mean in terms of our allocation problem? Because part of the output of five is going to three, but part is going to two directly without uh, seeing three. So how do we know what should three be responsible for? So when we look at this, we kind of, uh, I went back to some of the examples of supply chains, and this is something quite common if the companies are trying, let's say, to do a product footprint. So one example of this was Timberland. So Timberland uh, was trying to be environmentally cautious, uh, and they wanted to measure what is the impact of their shoes. And the biggest part is uh, the leather, and the leather comes from cows, and cows can generate a lot of uh, uh, greenhouse gases through the burping and uh, emissions of methane. Uh, so they talked to their suppliers, and the suppliers said, oh, you should just put zero. No, why should we put zero? There is emissions coming from all other. They said, no, but, you know, but they are growing cows anyway for meat, for milk, and so on. So, you know, they, the cows will be there whether you're making shoes or not, so you should just put zero. So this did not seem right to these guys, so they decided to look at uh, what is the value of different outputs from a cow, 
uh, monetary, and then based on this to allocate emissions. So they decided that about 8%, uh, I think, of the emissions from the cow should be allocated to other manufacturing and use this uh, in the uh, in the calculations. And similar thing is done by Nike for their shoes and so on. And so the companies, what they do is actually, uh, if we look at, let's say, this is going uh, to make shoes, this is going to make meat. So the companies know how to split these so they can do some uh, internal calculations when they have co-products, how some emissions should be split among different co-products. And we're doing this, what we can do is we can separate this graph, uh, this game, into two different games. And each of these is a tree. And as we said, like one of the properties of Shapley value is additivity. So what we have here is the same total cost, same total emissions. Uh, we can calculate on this three Shapley value, we can calculate on this three Shapley value using the algorithm from before, and just add these numbers to get the Shapley value for the original game. And so we can do this for uh, all more complex uh, examples so that we can still have this nice property ease of calculation on three graphs, we just have to decompose all graphs to three graphs. So what we have <coughs> looked here is kind of try to see uh, how can we find a way to allocate emissions that will actually get right incentives in supply chains. So we model this uh, as a convex game. And we found that Shapley value from very different approaches seems to meet the criteria that such an allocation rule should have. Now, uh, so it's kind of nice theoretically, but clearly if you look at practice, uh, many supply chains are international, so it becomes much more difficult to see how we can implement some of these things, especially since in some communities there are some uh, uh, legislations implemented and some they are not. So I really like this, uh, this figure because it shows emissions by country and how it is related to where the products being uh, produced are actually being used. So if you look at China, so clearly China generates huge amount of pollution, but about uh, 400 uh, megatons are generated for products being used in the US. About uh, 300 megatons are generated for products being used in Europe and about 200 megatons for products being used in Japan. So is it fair to have China be responsible for all these emissions and to kind of if we are imposing taxes for them to pay? Well, if the customers in these countries did not want these products, if the firms in these countries did not order these products, these emissions would not be generated. So there should be some shared responsibility. And we think that some of these new international agreements like Paris Agreement, for instance, uh, uh, or this uh, joint uh, kind of trading uh, system of carbon uh, with uh, uh, California, Quebec, and Ontario, maybe some indication that we can actually end up with some international kind of way of dealing with how to allocate these emissions and try to give some right incentives for companies to actually work on reducing them. And just uh, before the end, I just want to mention, so the, as I said that I started recently to do uh, some research in uh, environmental sustainability. So there is a, a, one of the first papers was one with my student Fang Tian, which, in which we were looking at uh, how to deal with recycling because when companies are recycling together, there can be some uh, uh, forces that are drawing them to do together, like economies of scale can help reduce the cost. But when you have more diverse set of products, it can also make you want to not do things together because it can increase the cost when you have more diversified. Uh, influx. At the same time, companies can also be competitors in their primary market. So we wanted to see, can we say something about uh, what is likely to become stable if you look at such a setting. Uh, then with my uh, other PhD student, uh, we are looking at recycling of uh, materials such as glass, paper and so on. So which of these actually uh, are uh, desirable from a monetary perspective because of some of them materials and collection can, can have different relationships and what are some kind of incentives like if we are looking at who should impose some levels of uh, recycling quota should governments do it and in what way to actually uh, improve the impact on the environment and so with Danny and Frida I was working on this paper and we are also starting to look at something about cap and trade program uh, so how can we uh, perhaps find some better ways to uh, deal with uh, allocating emissions in cap and trade programs? And with this I would conclude my talk and if there are any questions, yeah, I would try to answer them.
have two questions. Sure. Don't mind. So the first one is just a curiosity. So in the case of the tax, okay. so one of the, mm -hmm. uh, one of the two procedures, yeah. okay. sheet flat. Uh, yes, so uh, I mean, currently what is implementing it's just it's a flat tax and uh, I mean, there, there are some uh, of course critiques of implementing uh, carbon tax. So British Columbia, so what they claim is that they return all the money into tax to the population because it's kind of okay if you are paying tax then the companies will pass it to us so you know we are the ones who actually are paying for it so uh, BC claims that they return everything to improvement in the air condition public transportation and so on so that they are returning this back to the population who is paying for the final product but actually trying to make companies work on reducing the emissions okay. and the second one if I <laughs> so uh, okay. is this is this related with the river pollution problem? So you know the problem that you know the rest of the river and you have no, no. So uh, I mean, here we specifically looked at carbon emissions, but it can be done to different problems. So I said we started with the paper which was looking at carbon emissions. So this was kind of how we in general extended it, but uh, it can be done for different things. It's not necessarily just river pollution. I mean, when you look at supply chains, there are water pollution can be one thing, there can be you know, the uh, emissions, there can be acidification, there can be all the different impact that production system supply chains can have. So the fact that we mentioned greenhouse gas here, it's not the only one, but uh, for the other ones so far, I think there is even less legislation. So. No, I'm, I'm saying this because uh, there are several papers with mm -hmm. this, with this uh, pollution problem mm -hmm. in the river, and they also characterize the Shapley Valley. Mm -hmm. But the thing with are different properties, and up to my knowledge, they were not able to solve the problem when you don't. They, they solve the problem when you have a, a river, a, a profound line. They solve the problem with, when you have trees. Mm -hmm. But up to my knowledge, they were not able to solve it when you have general rats. Okay. Uh, and that's what they actually would do. And they also have s s properties similar to yours, mm -hmm. but not exactly the same. So I'm just saying that. If yeah. You want to so we can check that. Thank you. Uh, can, can you put again uh, uh, two slides previous? No, this one. Uh, I think, uh, under my point of view, uh, my point of view is uh, from the point of the industrial organization, mm -hmm. I think this is a, a, a two sided uh, principal aiding problem. Because uh, you are talking about uh, the responsibility of consumers, but also the responsibility in which the uh, the, the service or, or the item is producing. But I think uh, uh, this is a principal problem because uh, con con uh, consumers need uh, an incentive to behave more uh, green, and the same for that producers who produce a, a, a service uh, which uh, emit pollution or mm -hmm. CO2 gas emissions. So I think this is a, a very interesting point of view uh, of this problem. Uh, not a principal aid problem, uh, this is a two-sided principal mm -hmm. aid problem. I, uh, I don't know about the literature, but uh, I think it's very interesting. No, and as you mentioned, like consumers, so one of the proposals that we uh, that motivated us also is that you can have a consumer as the uh, end point, and even if you're not imposing taxes, just giving them information on product, you know, this is what this product, your responsibility would be. So if you are comparing two products, you can see, okay, this one is greener, so why don't you choose this one, because this is how you are helping the environment, so it can be done in that way. Do you need to know the label? So this, this, like, if you you can put some value to the claim, something is green or not, because now you have just the stickers green without really knowing what's behind this, and this can give you something measurable to say, you know, this product, your responsibility is like uh, five kilos of CO2, or for this it's four. So if you want to be green, pick the one with four. Any other question? Yeah. Uh, so uh, Roberto asked you before about the definition of the game. Mm -hmm. I mean, the green game, mm -hmm. the final cost for coalition mm -hmm. is the sum of 
all in mission. Yeah. But is a mission is just for each player and it does not depend on the coalition you are or it's not related. No, no, so we assume that there is, you know, each arc there is some mission. Different players can be responsible for doing something about it. They can have an impact on it. So you can, if this is coming like from you directly, you have direct responsibility, but there can be some other players who can be responsible indirectly for those emissions. Yeah. But you are not considering the structure of the graph or something like that, because as you put out uh, before, you have a graph. With the yes, but it's... Uh, because the graph, if you consider a graph again yeah. related to the graph, you can use the minus and value. No, so that there can be different things you can do. But for instance, so here, let's say we have this is Apple. We can say, okay, they can be responsible for everything because they can have an impact on their suppliers, on their distributors being used and so on. So we can say, let's say, this guy is responsible indirectly for everything. We can say, okay, this, this guy is just moving things around. So he's responsible only for what actually comes out of his vehicles and so on. Let's say this guy, we can say maybe responsible for this because he's free to choose, but maybe Apple told them you have to pick this supplier so he's not responsible for this thing indirectly. So we can have different things and this is why we said we, uh, one of the things is we assume that there is some powerful player who is allocating these responsibilities. That's one of the things, starting points. So yeah. we have to assume something and this seemed in line with some of the things we are observing now. So in general it can be uh, similar to as you know greenhouse gas protocol came up with some rules about scope 1 scope 2 scope 3 perhaps you know in the future there can be some entity that can say you know all distributors are responsible just for their emissions all the manufacturers for this and that so there can be some guidelines similar to this that can help in alloc allocating these things for now we are leaving it uh, pretty open to this powerful player in the in the supply chain yeah, in that sense, you have a complex game. Yeah. Yeah, but maybe should be, I think, maybe it should be good try to consider some kind of relation with the coalition. No, but I said we... Uh, you, you never thought to do that in uh, no, the uh, environment of the play chain. I said we... So it's we it is, but it's, uh, uh, so I said, one of the things is there is no clear legislation. So if we commit to something and if there is different legislation coming out, then you throw everything away. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, uh, until there is some specific guidelines coming out, we left it pretty open so that it can fit in different settings. If there is some specific legislation, then we can say, okay, this is how this should actually be allocated. This is what can come out of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your nice presentation. Yeah. Thank you.